Hi everyone, uh, this morning's reading is from Ruth, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14. Follow along with me please. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will not return with you to your people. No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they had grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. This is the word of God. Well, welcome to my office. A bit of a different location to what we had earlier. Um, that's because it's gotten a little bit uh, wet outside, so we thought we'd bring it in. And the reason we're here in my office is because we're going to open God's Word. That's what we like to do at Aldinga Bay. And uh, in fact, we, we like to work our way through series. And normally those series are books of the Bible. And today we are starting a new series, the book of Ruth. It's a small book in the Old Testament. And it's a really warm story in the book of Ruth. Uh, some of you would be familiar with it. It's a story that is very much about uh, hope coming from despair. There's probably two really key themes in the book of Ruth. One is uh, it's a story about kindness. Okay, so it's a story about kindness. Wants to hear that. And then secondly, is a story about providence. So kindness. It's a nice thought, isn't it? We we uh, have probably at the moment hearing some things about acts of kindness, particularly you know toward our health workers, people are appreciative with COVID-19 going on and some people are making meals for them and, you know, just showing acts of kindness. What does it mean, kindness, when we think about it? Well, I guess it's about being generous toward other people. It's about, um, you know, just showing uh, our love and concern for them. And when I think about the book of Ruth, that's that's very much what it talks about there, although it's probably at a slightly deeper level. Uh, some of the acts of kindness here are really deep. There's genuine displays of love, even to the point of being self-sacrificing, you know, seeking to bless another person, even though it might not be the best thing at the time for yourself. So it's a beautiful book in that way. Kindness. It's a wonderful thought to think about, isn't it? We're called to be kind. Secondly, it's about providence. You see, the, this book is uh, people showing kindness to one another, but it's ultimately about God showing kindness toward us. You know, providence, the idea that God takes uh, the events of this world and he uses them for his purpose to bless this world. I reckon that's worth thinking about, isn't it? 
we need to hear that God is in the business of blessing this world. I reckon the reason we need to hear that is because it doesn't always seem that way. Sometimes uh, it can seem really dark. Sometimes it can seem really harsh in our lives. You know, bad things happen and it's like we're all alone. It's like God's abandoned us. It's like he, you know, he's given up on us and it doesn't seem like there's much hope at all been a pastor for a long time and I, I think I've seen that at times in people's lives and and maybe you know you can think back about your own life and you think well it just seems that way sometimes maybe it seems like that now what's really important is that this book the book of Ruth actually starts that way it's a story of sadness it's some of the characters in this story feel like God has just given up on them they feel like where is God why is he allowed this to happen why is he allowed to be so sad and so dark? So chapter one goes, in fact, it's all about sadness. But it actually ends, fortunately, with this glimmer of hope. But you've got to look for it. But it's there, this glimmer of hope. And then it unpacks throughout the rest of the story. But I'll take you through chapter one today, the first part of the series. Ruth, chapter one. And I want us to see what's going on and hear the story and see what God is telling us, how he's speaking to us. Where is God, in fact, when life seems so harsh? I reckon that's a pretty good question for us to reflect on as we open up chapter 1. Anyway, let me take you through it. I'm going to read the first two verses so we get a sense of what's going on. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, feel free to follow along. I'm reading from the ESV version, verses 1 and 2, Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, it says, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech. The name of his wife was Naomi. And the name of his sons were Marlon and Chilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, and they went into the country of Moab, and they remained there. A couple of key names you want to remember there, Elimelech and um, Naomi. Those names are going to come up again and again, particularly the name Naomi. It's worth hearing those verses. I want you to, if you're going to understand the book of Ruth, you have to understand some of the background that we're told in those two verses. It's worth unpacking that just for a little bit. Firstly, the thing we notice when we come to those two verses is that this is a historical story. It's about real people. It's a narrative. That's the way that so much of the Old Testament works, doesn't it? You know, Old Testament narrative is about the story of God's people. And this is a story about a particular family, Elimelech, his wife, Naomi, and their two sons. So as the story goes, it tells us about the setting as well. Uh, Naomi and Elimelech, they lived during the time of the judges. Well, that probably rings a bit of a bell for us. And again, worth hearing. Uh, last year at Aldinga Bay, we did a series uh, from the book of Judges. And uh, in some ways, it was a bit of a tough series uh, because it had lots of interesting stories. But it's set during this really dark and violent time for the nation of Israel. What's just happened, if you remember, in the book of Judges, the setting for the book of Ruth as well, is that... Uh, they've just come into the promised land. They haven't been there that long. They've had Joshua, who has led them. He's been this great leader, but now he's dead. And things just don't go so well after that. They just ebb and flow. They follow God and they forget God. Um, in fact, uh, the book of Judges is really characterized by this phrase that's repeated a couple of times. And that is that in those days, there was no king. And so the people did what was right in their own eyes. A time when there was a lack of leadership and people just did what they thought was right, which often wasn't very good at all. So the time of Judges, it's a, it's a harsh time, it's a troubling time. And interestingly, the book of Ruth starts, doesn't it, with trouble. It's not political, it's actually economic. We're told that there is a famine in the land of Bethlehem. Now that's worth hearing too. The word Bethlehem, when we hear that, it rings some bells, doesn't it? Bethlehem, keep on reading, is the birthplace of Jesus. We sing about it every Christmas time. Jesus was born there. Well, this is some time before that, probably around about 1,200 years before the birth of Jesus, uh, the story of Ruth, something like that. And um, 
It's interesting though, Mary and Joseph, they go to Bethlehem in the Christmas story and Jesus is born there. The very reason they go to Bethlehem is because of what happens in the story of Ruth. We'll see that later on. This is the city of David. We'll get to that eventually. But at this time, when the people hear Bethlehem, when the Old Testament people are reading this story, they're not thinking about Jesus at all. They're actually thinking about something else. See, the word Bethlehem is really significant. Uh, the Hebrew meaning of the word Bethlehem is house of bread. And ironically, at the moment, there is a famine there. There is no bread in the house of bread. And so Elimelech decides to take his wife and children and to move to the land of Moab. And that's kind of an interesting thing to do, to leave and to go to the land of Moab. It's kind of like uh, living in South Korea and having a famine there, so deciding to take your family to North Korea. I mean, who would do something like that? It seems like a bit of a crazy thing to do. Uh, people of South Korea aren't friends with the people of North Korea. And that's exactly what we're supposed to pick up on in this story, I think. The people of Israel, people of Bethlehem, uh, of Israel, Judah, they're not friends with the Moabites. There's a fair bit of history there. If you work your way through the Bible up until this point, you would have already seen some of that. Uh, we haven't got time to go into it properly this morning, but just a quick heads up. There's the story of Balaam, uh, which involves the Moabites in the Old Testament, the infamous story of Balaam and his donkey. You know, it ends up in massive judgment coming upon Israel. And that's because of the role that the Moabites play in that story. So it hasn't been good. They haven't started well with the Moabites. And then even in the book of Judges itself, there's another story. It's the uh, it's one of my favorite stories, the very comical story of the chubby King Eglon and how he's eventually routed by the left-handed swordsman Ehud. But before he's defeated by Ehud, um, we're told that the Israelites were in servitude to the Moabites for something like 18 years. So there hasn't been a good history. You think, why is it that... Elimelech takes his family to Moab to live there. Well, it's because there's a famine. And really, it's it's this. Um, Elimelech is wanting to find life for his family in Moab. So he leaves God's people, he leaves God's land, and he goes there. But instead of finding life, the narrator is really wanting us to know, and he tells us pretty quickly, instead of finding life, they find Death. This is how it goes. Verse 3, they've just moved to Moab. And it says, But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These sons took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years. Some really important names we need to remember there, Orpah and Ruth. Ruth in particular keeps on coming up again. That's what the book is about. It's about her. But then it says, not only did Elimelech die, but both Marlon and Chilion, Naomi's sons, they too died. So the woman was left without her two sons and without her husband. You have to understand at this point that this is a terribly sad story. We need to buy into that emotionally. It's terrible what's going on. Naomi has been left without a husband and without sons. I mean, that's bad in and of itself. Uh, but it's made even worse because in ancient times, uh, the whole security of the family was tied up around the males. Naomi has no more males left in her life. That means she has no land, she has no home, she has no way of really earning a proper amount of money to more livelihood just to get by. She is a woman that is destitute, and so are her two daughter-in-laws. We have to hear that. You know, it's true, isn't it? Some people just seem to have a really rough time in life. And you can probably think of some stories yourself. In fact, it wasn't very long ago that Jackie and I were in Bow Hill. We owned some property in Bow Hill. It's by the River Murray in South Australia, and and we went through the cemetery there, 
And as we walked through the cemetery, I said, Jack, it's interesting looking at all these headstones. I reckon just about half of them are people that are below 50. You know, it's an, it's an old cemetery. You know, life was really tough back 100 plus years ago. In fact, not even that. I, I was looking at um, three graves next to each other. And there were three children belonging to the same family. One was an infant when they died. The other one was a 16-year-old girl and she died. And then her brother drowned seemingly in River Murray at age 23. It was back in the 1970s. How would it be to be those parents? Must must be so hard. You know, sometimes life is really hard for people. And that's exactly what it's like for Naomi. Life is really hard for her. There's this question that's behind all of this chapter one, and it says, Why has God dealt so harshly with me? You know, where is he? How come he isn't there for me at the moment? That seems to be the question that's really being posed and with that we move on to the second scene in the story first one's about departure leaving Bethlehem and the second scene really is about going back it's about returning let me read some of that to you as well verse 6 then she Naomi arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughter-in-laws and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. There's a couple of themes in that already. It's One, it it tells us that uh, the grapevine is working really well. No phones in those days. But uh, she's heard while she's been in the field fields of Moab, that there is bread once again in Bethlehem. In fact, she says, or it says, that the Lord had visited his people. It's the idea of providence, isn't it? God is at work. He's behind the scenes. He is bringing about blessing. So she's heard that and she decides it's time to go home. It's a good thing. Return back to the promised land. But it's complicated. You see, as I said before, this is a time when all the security in a family was tied up around the males. And going back to Bethlehem with her two daughter-in-laws, Orpah and Ruth, is probably not going to be good for them. The Moabites, the outsiders, they're not friends of the people of Israel. Uh, The best thing that could happen to Orpah and Ruth is that they get remarried, and the best shot they've got at being remarried would be going back to Moab and being with the people there. I mean, it's too late for Ruth. She's never going to get married again. She's too old, she thinks. But Orpah and, and Ruth, was, you know, for them, it's not too late. They are, they are uh, young women. And so Naomi says, go back. Go back to your to your own people. And there's a lot of tears around that. But eventually, Orpah, one of the daughter-in-laws, says, you know what? That just makes sense. I'm going to go home, back to my own people, and I'm going to live with them. So she kisses Naomi goodbye, and she goes off on her way. But it's different with Ruth. You know, we need to just hear what's going on there. Ruth says, there's no way that I'm going to leave you, Naomi. I am going to go with you. This is where, again, there's this beautiful picture of kindness in this passage. In fact, there's this really lovely script here in uh, in verses 15 through to verse 18. We didn't read it earlier, but it it, it is a really well-known passage. You know, sometimes read at weddings. It's the sort of thing that finds itself on inspirational calendars and things like that. But listen to the words. So Naomi said, go back. Your best shot at a future is to go back to Moab and find a husband, start all over again. Seems they haven't got kids of their own or, or whatever. Orpah says, I'm going to go. But Ruth says, no, Naomi, I'm going to go with you. And this is how it goes. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. 
Your people shall be my people and your God shall be my God. Where you die, I will die. There I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me and more so also. If anything but death parts me from you. It's a beautiful picture of kindness, isn't it? Ruth loves her mother-in-law. She said, basically, I'm leaving behind my own mother. You are now my mother. I love you so much. I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to sacrifice my own future just to go to be with you, Naomi, and spend the rest of my life with you. And it is a picture of kindness. And that's the way that God treats us, isn't it? You know, he is a kind God. Story of the gospel. Jesus lays down his own life, his others orientated. Ruth is a bit of a picture like that. It's worth hearing that, isn't it? We are called to be kind toward other people. We're to be examples of kindness as Christians. Ruth is certainly like that, a point worth hearing. But it's not just a picture of kindness. It's also a picture of faith. We're supposed to see that in this picture, in this story. Ruth says, not only am I going to go where you go and die where you die, but she also says, your God is going to be my God and your people are going to be my people. That's covenantal language. That's a story of somebody who's had a changed life. That is somebody who has seen the God of Israel, Yahweh, and she has said, I'm going to cling on to him. I am going to follow him. It's a good story. You know, God is a God who is for outsiders. We've already seen that in the biblical narrative up until this point, the story of Rahab, which comes you know, in, this, in the book of Joshua. She's an outsider, but she forsakes her nation and goes after the God of Israel when she's welcomed in. Now we're seeing it again, the story of Ruth an outsider coming in. And then in the future, we'll see it in abundance. The story of Jesus, the gospel story is about outsiders coming in. It's about God loving people from all backgrounds. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. You see, God is for outsiders coming in. And that is a very beautiful part of chapter one. In fact, it's probably about the only light that we see well maybe there's a little bit more later on but largely this is this is a real high point in chapter one the attitude of ruth sets up the rest of the book but for the most part chapter one is a story of sadness we need to hear that naomi is feeling really rattled where is god how come he's treated me so harshly and that's really how the last scene goes you, Listen to the words of Naomi in the last scene. Eventually, she, she does go back. She heads back with Ruth to Bethlehem. And it's interesting, you know, the, the town's on edge when she comes. They're excited to see her. They're wondering who this Moabite woman is with her. Listen to how it goes, verse 19 of chapter 1. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? And interestingly, this, notice what she says. Do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. It's an interesting point. Uh, in the book of Ruth, names mean something. We've already seen that with Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the house of bread that has no bread, ironically. And here, there's also some irony. Naomi, in the Hebrew, it means pleasant. And that's what she's saying. Don't call me pleasant. Not after all that's happened to me. Call me Mara. And it's because Mara means bitter. God has dealt bitterly with me. And she goes on and and she tells us that I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? The Almighty has brought calamity upon me. There's something very, very interesting about those words. You know, 
In fact, it's not just those words, but the whole time through the Old Testament in particular, but you certainly see it in the New Testament too, is that everything is attributed to God, good and bad. There's, there's no escaping it. Good things happen. They come from the hand of God, like there's bread back in Bethlehem. The Lord has visited his people. Good things have happened, but Elimelech's died as well as Marlon and Chilion, and that's come from God too. And, you know, she's got no future and no hope, and she says everything's come from God. And that's why we are supposed to think. You know, I don't think that it's always pitched that way, but it's supposed to be. That's the way we're supposed to think. God is sovereign. God is behind everything. In fact, sometimes we've said at Aldinga Bay, we've said that, you know, God is behind good and he's behind evil. It's just that he's not behind them in the same way, but he's still behind them. There's a lot that we could say about that, but just simply today, I want you to hear this, is that, is that God is a God who is sovereign. He is at work and he is the one who rules over this world in every way. It's true can be hard to deal with suffering because we think, well, if God's a good God, why does he let bad things happen? Yeah, I know, that's a, that's a big question. But nonetheless, Naomi is right. She thinks God is the one who has brought calamity upon her. Well, in some ways he has. But she's not entirely right. It's the other side. She's missing something. She thinks that God has abandoned her. That's how it sort of reads, doesn't it? He's abandoned her. But he hasn't abandoned her. In fact, her words are really telling. She says, I've gone out full. I mean, they didn't have any food, but what she means is I had a husband and two sons. I went away full, but now I'm coming back empty. I haven't got anything. But she's missing something. There's a person standing right next to her. The person standing next to Naomi is Ruth. Ruth seems invisible. She seems almost inconsequential to, to Naomi. I think Naomi's very glad she's there. She's no doubt very glad for her kindness, but what difference can Ruth make? But the truth is she's going to make plenty of difference. And the last verse in chapter 1 sort of tips its hat in that direction. It's a veiled hope in the midst of despair. Listen to it. Naomi doesn't see Ruth, but the narrator does. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Oh, I wonder what's going to happen. The beginning of the barley harvest It's kind of like, well, that last verse is a transition verse between all the sadness of chapter 1 and all that's yet to happen in chapter 2. Naomi feels like she's alone, that God's abandoned her. But she isn't alone. Ruth is with her, and so is God. It's an important point, isn't it, to remember. God is providentially at work. There's lots of sad things that happen. God allows those sad things to happen, otherwise they wouldn't. But he's still a God who is kind. He's still a God who is in the business of blessing. Blessing's going to happen in this story. And we know he's in the business of blessing because that's the gospel. That's the story of Jesus, isn't it? We just celebrated Easter. He who knew no sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. God has given us so much, Paul says in Romans 8. You know, he's given us Jesus. How much more can we be confident that he'll give us all things that we need? Eventually, one day we'll be with him. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. These are beautiful thoughts, and maybe that's what we need to hear today as we reflect on the book of Ruth. Sometimes it can seem really harsh in life. Sometimes it can feel really lonely, unjust and difficult. But there is a kind God. He sometimes brings kind people into our life to encourage us, and that's what we should do with one another. We should encourage each other, build each other up, and help each other to flourish. But ultimately, it's God who is kind. And he is at work. We know that because of the gospel. 
take that on board. I, I trust that's an encouragement for you. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the story of Ruth and Naomi. We thank you that you love us. Thank you that this book speaks of that deeply. We thank you that what speaks of it even deeper is the story of Jesus, where this whole thing goes. We thank you for the gospel. May we be encouraged in you, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen.